hangout from the National Science Foundation and the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. We're pretty excited here today because we have news from the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, which we refer to as ALMA. And with us here, um, virtually anyway, we have some scientists from uh, NRAO and ALMA that um, are going to tell us a little bit about this news. Um, Involving the what is it the L A H L Tau the the distant baby star 450 light years from Earth and uh, being able to see the planet formation that occurs around this infant star um, so so far away and incredible clarity. So with us we've got Stuart Quarter, um, the deputy director from ALMA. We have Crystal Brogan, uh, National Radio Astronomy Observatory uh, astronomer. We have Anthony Ramajan, Ramajan from uh, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory also. He's a program scientist. And uh, is Al Wooten with us as well, with you, Charles? Want to give a wave? He will, he will be joining us in a little bit. We've got, so we have uh, the North American ALMA program scientist joining us in a little bit. And we have Charles Blue, who's going to help me moderate from the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Because he's been doing astronomy stuff a lot longer than I have. So. Uh, I wanted to start off by just having Stuart tell us a little bit about today's uh, news and why it's such a big deal. All right, uh, thank you. One of the original sort of top five goals of, uh, of building ALMA was to image nearby uh, planet forming disks around young stars at a resolution of, of approximately an Earth orbit. And we've spent a lot of time, I would say, over the last 12 months initially mostly just in the planning phase down here at ALMA, but more recently in the last six months, really accelerating the process of finishing the infrastructure required to actually occupy the antenna stations that are more distant, the ones that give us the higher resolution down here at ALMA, uh, as well as, as rolling into sort of uh, July, August, starting to move all of the antennas. In total, we moved uh, 23 antennas out from the, the central array uh, in, a, in a very uh, tight, compact configuration to a much more spread configuration. And by doing so, for the first time, we've achieved an image uh, of this sort of, you know, of this top level ALMA goal of, of having a roughly one astronomical unit, so one Earth orbit resolution in one of the major nearby star forming regions, that being Taurus, which uh, HL Tari is a, is a member of. In terms of the scientific importance of this source, I think what what we feared, at least at some level when observing this, is we would see a nice flat disk, which would actually make it very difficult to detect with any sort of interesting structure for ALMA. But instead, when we, uh, when we opened this, when Crystal made the first version of this image a, a few weeks ago now, I think we were all shocked at the level of structure that we could see in the disk. And one of the reasons that this is so surprising is that most models of planet formation don't have large sort of planetary cores forming this early, or if they do form this early, the source is uh, of order a million years old, they tend to spiral inward to the central star and be destroyed. Hmm. But what we're seeing here is not only have we formed these large planetary cores, but um, we, we have them in nice stable orbits where they're, they're sculpting the rest of the disk. So that's sort of the, uh, the, the sort of programmatic and, and scientific context for the image. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Well, I, I'm curious. So, so what did we do in the past then, if we wanted to see things like this, or we just didn't see them? I mean, how, how was it handled in the past? And anyone can jump in and, and answer that. It doesn't have to be Stuart. Feel free. Well, I think the short answer to that we didn't. Um, I mean, observing things like this, you know, at this level of resolution was was sort of completely impossible before. If you take a look at what this disk looked like in previous images, you saw maybe, if you were lucky, a couple of resolution elements across the disk. So instead of the image you're seeing there, you know, say three or four pixels across the disk or, or one or two, depending on the direction you're talking about. So instead, we have, you know, dozens, if not more, resolution elements, depending on the, uh, the axis you're talking about. So you really have gone from seeing a nice to seeing a real, you know, clear, pristine image that allows you to really talk about what the small-scale structure is. Okay, well, let me let me jump in here. I mean, Crystal, you were the first person to actually see this. I mean, what's, 
okay, you reduce the data, you take a look at this image, and what, what was your first reaction? Uh, my first reaction was um, just joy, really, because I was so excited that after all of the, the years of work from hundreds of people to make this possible that we were finally seeing something that, that really completely justified all of the effort that has gone into this project. And so it was just super exciting. I feel really lucky to have been the first, first person to see the image. So one of the, the nice things about uh, these Google Hangouts is it gives an opportunity for the people tuning in to ask questions. And in fact, if uh, folks who are tuning in don't realize this, you can tweet us a question at uh, hashtag NSF Live or email us at webcast at NSF.gov. And in fact, we've actually gotten a few questions in. So I'm going to go ahead and ask some of those questions. Um, uh, how does this system com compare to our solar system? Is it a direct analog? Who wants to, who wants to answer that? Uh-oh, tough question. Do you, do, you huh? me, do you want me to throw this one up to Al, see if he can come over here and answer that? No, I mean, I, 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 can, I can answer that. It's not a direct analog. The, uh, the source is, I mean, the, in the end, uh, we, we've done a little bit of, of initial looking at the, the gas maps, which we already have, but we haven't released today. And you can actually weigh the star uh, by looking at how the gas orbits around the disk. And, and, a, and a very crude initial estimate of that shows that it's probably going to be about half, again, as massive as the sun. And this system is also much larger in terms of the structure of the disk now. But of course, no one can say what will happen in, uh, in 4 billion years or something when the ages start to become somewhat comparable, or even in a few hundred million years when most of the, the, the natal material is blown off and we start having reprocessing going on in the disk. Uh, you know, the planetesimals start slamming into each other rather than just collecting mass. It could look like a solar analog, but with this slightly more massive, you know, central star. But it's really hard to tell at this point what the, the end game of this, this system will look like, especially without really doing some detailed models of, of how the gas will interact with the dust. And of course, given that this image is sort of calling into question some of the existing models, it'll be a while before we have new models that we'll be able to uh, make reasonable predictions of what how this thing will evolve, evolve over the next, you know, 200, 300 million years. If I could expand on that a little bit, maybe for people who might not be as familiar, if you compare HL Tau to the wide array of possible stars, it's similar to the sun. If you yeah. look at it in detail, it's a bit more massive uh, than our sun, but there are much, much more massive stars than our sun and much, much less massive stars than our sun. Okay. And I, ha I actually have another technical question like this as well. And um, so I'll throw this out as well. Can the gaps be explained by a single planet with multiple resonances in the young gaseous, gaseous disk? I told you it was a technical question. That, that, that question sort of implies that we've done a lot more with this, uh, this image <laughs> than we actually have. Um, the, we, we basically, as soon as we got the image and, and did some verification that what we were seeing was actually real, uh, we started with this process of, of the release. In terms of doing a detailed analysis on potential resonant structures and even the relative spacings of the gaps and things like that, we, we haven't even begun to start on that process and in fact, I expect that uh, someone in the community may be one of the people that, that, that does that, because eventually this data will be released to the, uh, the, the astronomical community worldwide, and people will be able to uh, do that kind of study on their own. But uh, we haven't even come close to doing the calculations needed with this disk to, to answer that question. You know, Stuart, you raise it really. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Crystal. I was going to say, it might amuse people to know that the the last data set that went into this image was taken on Halloween. <laughs> and I finished making this image about 7 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday. So we haven't actually had it for very long. <laughs> now, so why does it take so long, actually, to, to put this all together? I mean, what, what goes into to making these, these images? It's sort of a, I, mean, I guess I'm asking sort of a basic astronomy question in terms of, 
it's really easy for somebody like me who's not an astronomer to think about an optical telescope that you can literally see what you're seeing. But with radio astronomy, it's quite a bit different and, and sort of hard for somebody like me to wrap my head around. So how, how do you end up creating uh, these amazing pictures using radio astronomy? Okay, so that'll take Crystal about an hour and a half to explain. So we can okay, well, I need to short, else from here on short out. answer. <laughs> Benny, do you want to give a short answer? No, I'm, I'm letting you take this one. Please. <laughs> so uh, what happens with an array like ALMA is that all of the signals from all of the antennas are combined together in a big, big computer called the correlator. And so we receive that data as a bunch of amplitudes and phases that describe basically where the photons came from on the sky. And so we have to do a fair amount of computer processing to turn that information into an image. Mm -hmm. And because there are so many antennas in ALMA, which is what allows us to make images with such high fidelity, the data sets are very large. And so the larger the data are, the longer it takes to process them and scrutinize them for any problems in the data and so on. Is there any subjectivity to it when you're, when you're working with this data? Or, or no, it's one person working with it would be the same as another's? There's, there's certainly some subjectivity in terms of, of what you decide is bad data, uh, what you decide to excise from the data. Um, there are a lot of choices that can be made when you're actually making an image. Mm -hmm. uh, for this image, because uh, it was so spectacular and had so many details and features in it, uh, we actually imaged it several different ways to make sure that none of the key features were imaging artifacts um, or would be particularly different if you made different choices about the imaging. Okay. Okay. I have I actually am like stack their question stacking up here, so I'm going to ask another uh, tweeted in question. Uh, can you tell us more about the age of HL Tau? How secure is the age, and why is this image so surprising in this context? Stuart, I think that's yeah. <laughs> ages of these uh, these objects are actually fairly uncertain to within a factor of, uh, I would say, 50% if I was being uh, fairly so, honest. So a million years, plus or minus a million years? Yeah, I would say a, a, a million. The errors on the upper side are probably smaller than the uh, the errors on the lower side. So I, I would say that, you know, half a million to uh, a million and a half or maybe a million and a quarter or so. Uh, but I mean, those age determinations are actually very difficult to make uh, reliably. There's a there's a variety of different methods, but getting convergence among those is actually very difficult. And I mean, in terms of why is this so surprising, is that most of the the previous models would predict that you could form a rock or you could form a, a large planet by some kind of local instability in this coming together. But everything predicts that the that these things would then be swept inward rather rather rapidly along uh, along streamlines, but we don't see any of those here. We see a nice, seemingly very well ordered system, and so that is not really at all what we would have expected of an object at this age. Okay. Well, you mentioned the um, something about instability or stability, so I'm gonna that segues into this next question. I think sort of could this be planet formation via gravitational instability? Looking at rings, and they look like maybe a disk instability. Yeah, I mean, I think in order to answer that question in detail, we'd have to go into the gaseous disk, which this is only the the thermal dust emission. So the the dust is sort of of order one one hundredth of the total mass of a disk at this level uh, within the context of this kind of age of object. So without having a clear picture of what the gas dynamics are doing, it's it's very difficult to assess that here. Uh, we have taken data of the gas, but the process that Crystal described for making this continuum image, which is, of course, one pixel deep in terms of uh, frequency space, the gas image is 4,000 pixels deep. So we have a lot more work to do on that. And also, the, the exact configuration we have in the array is not exactly perfect for 
for gas uh, gas measurements and these kind of objects. So it's it's a question that this experiment was not particularly designed to to answer, but it but Alma will very well go a long way to answering some of those questions about disk instabilities, but we'll have to do it with a slightly more compact configuration. Is this a situation where this data then sort of moves outward and other astronomers are from all over the world because this is an international telescope? Um, is this something that, that then other people are finding the answers to some of these questions that people are asking us today that are very technical in nature? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole process will eventually be that we'll offer this capability to the astronomical community and they can make proposals to do observe these kind of objects. But even this object specifically, I mean, the process as we move forward from this is that uh, with specifically with HL Tau, Crystal will continue looking at the at this data. We have additional data that we're looking into making other images. Our job at the uh, at the observatory and specifically uh, Tony's Tony's team is to evaluate those images and compare them to existing data and make sure that we're coming up with something that's vaguely consistent, although in this case it's very challenging because, you know, like I said before, you have two or three pixels in the existing data across the whole disk as opposed to, you know, sure. any <laughs> pixels across this disk. But we'll try to do the comparison as best we can. And as soon as that process is finished, we'll package up the data and we will release it to the community and they can do whatever they want with it in terms of, uh, of, of investigations within these data sets themselves. So people want to access to the I think one of the major highlights of the campaign is that we specifically designed not a test just for looking at systems like this, but a large range of science goals um, and objectives that we are going to release to the community to do whatever they want with. So scientists from around the world really get a first crack at what the capabilities are for ALMA, but not just looking at this you know, particular case and this particular data set that will be released, but along a lot of other different types of science cases, you know, everything from you know, solar system objects all the way out to you know, gravitational lens galaxies. So that's the real uh, highlight of the campaign that we put together is to provide these data to the community as quickly as we can after the campaign is over so they have first crack at looking at the data and then preparing themselves for the next proposal deadline. Can, we have a, can I just uh, interject for something? Because we've had some additional people join in. And it might be nice if we just took a minute or two to just go back and talk about JPEG science. Uh, if somebody could look at the image again and just sort of talk us through what do we see in this from the center moving out and why does it look this way to us? So, again, people who are just tuning in or, or maybe haven't gotten the full picture of it, uh, tell us what we're seeing. Let's just uh, try that one more time. Or I, I guess this is mostly in my my area. So what we're seeing at the you know the 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 brightness is really dust grains. So it's small dust grains, you know things of order, you know a sa sand particles in size up to maybe if you wanted to call it a small pebble. Um, that's largely what this emission is is tracing those sort of particles in the disk. So very small pebbles, grains of sand, uh, maybe slightly smaller fluffy dust particles too. So what we're seeing is the, the thermal emission from those, those particles in the disk. So as they're heated up by the young central star, they emit light at, uh, at a temperature consistent, or at a, at a wavelength consistent with their temperature and size, which is what you're seeing here. Now, going outward, you see in the very center, that's not the star itself, that's actually just part of the disk, so there's probably even additional structure on finer scales. It's just very, uh, uh, it's hard to see with uh, with the image we have here. We can go for higher resolution at at, uh, at at different wavelengths of light to potentially probe that very inner core. But as you're going out, you're seeing the central, and then you see a gap where something has carved out a hole in the disk. So there are no longer small pebbles or dust or, uh, or grains of sand type of objects in, in that hole in the, in the brightness distribution. Something has gone along and swept up all of those things and sort of accreted them to itself. And then the disk goes back to normal, the gravitational influence of whatever that uh, particle that's sweeping through the ring is, has gone away, and the gravitational influence of the central star uh, becomes more important again. 
and you see another sort of nice flat part of the disk, uh, an, an annulus, so to speak, and then you hit another gap. And, and again, that gap is formed by something orbiting around clearing the space. Now, outside of that gap, things start to look a little bit more interesting. You might imagine seeing some additional sort of gaps looking like they're opening up, um, but they're not nice, complete, concentric rings. Um, outside of that main thicker annulus, you have a, a much wider gap. It looks like it may actually be composed of two gaps. It might break in half with a small peak in the middle. So, I mean, but basically what's happening in each of those gaps is you is it's almost certain you have something large that's grown up to the point where we can't see it with Alma, but it's sweeping up all of these small particles as it goes along. So, interestingly, since you mentioned gaps, we have a question that came in. What distance are the gaps from the star? Is this a type 2 migration gap opening with planet mass definitely greater than 10 m Earth? Meters Earth? I'm not sure what that means. Sorry, I'm not an astronomer. I apologize. I, I have an expectation that the person that asked that question could probably answer it better than I could. Um, uh, probably. <clears throat> or we could just go with the yes and move on. Okay, yeah, one of the yes or no questions. Or, I, we have no idea and move on. No, I mean, I think the... Uh, company is available so you can do the analyses. Yeah, no, I mean, I yeah, just, just to, to refer back to previous discussion, we haven't done much analysis on this. I mean, as Crystal said, right. the, the image itself was, was completed Tuesday morning. It is now Thursday morning, so we, uh, we haven't had a lot of time. And in fact, it's not actually within our remit right. for the, uh, campaign to do those kind of analysis. I mean, our, our job is to make sure that the results are within error bars consistent with expectations from before, and then give the data to the community and say, all right, have at it. Um, and we will do some of these kind of analysis in terms of the locations and the widths of the gaps and things like that, but hasn't even really started at this point. We're focusing on, uh, we have one more week left in the campaign. We're focusing on getting as much data in efficiently in that time as we can uh, and, and to make sure that we have all the information we need because as soon as this campaign ends, there's no more long baseline data from Alma for, for you know, of order a year, potentially maybe even a little longer. So that's our current focus. And so um, when, when do you think that the data will be released to the community? That's one of the other questions that's come in. It'll be within the next couple months after the campaign is over. So okay. hopefully by, um, let's say tentatively by the AAS meeting in January, we should have at least a very good date as to when the data will be released. Okay, and I have another yes or no question, I think. Uh, are there X-ray, IR, UV, or optical campaigns underway of the same object? That's a that's an interesting question. Um, I had a look at the various archives to see what was available for this source as soon as I made the image. In fact, on the Saturday afternoon when I made this image, I was really excited to see how it might compare to previous observations. And one of the interesting things is that this source is so young and there's so much dust there that it's completely obscured in the optical. If you look, for example, at a Hubble Space Telescope image, all you see is a reflection nebula uh, near the disk, but not coincident with it because it's completely obscured. Mm. Once you start moving into the near infrared, you start to pick up the photosphere of the star, but you still can't see the disk. Um, there have been some interesting near infrared observations of line emission that show a strong jet coming out of the, the star perpendicular to the disk. But in terms of actually detecting the disk itself, you can really only do that in the radio because all other wavelengths are obscured. So the campaign ends soon, and then and then what happens at, at Alma? So we after, will... What, no, sorry, go ahead, Tony. So after we start moving antennas next week back to a more compact configuration, so what we have been doing for the last three months is this dedicated campaign of um, looking at the extension of our capabilities for ALMA for cycle three. Once we go back to, um, at, at the end of these next couple of weeks here, as we move the antennas from the long baselines, we're going to a very compact configuration so we can continue on with the cycle two program um, that'll start ramping up again on December 3rd. And we'll be doing primarily early science observations starting December 3rd through um, the, um, through about February. 
Can I throw out just a, a blue sky question? Let's say a year from now we have the longest baselines. So we're at to 16 kilometers. We're at high frequency. We go back and look at this. Uh, are we going to see vastly different things? Is there ever a potential of seeing planets themselves uh, looking at this object? You know, if we had Alma at its its highest frequency, longest baseline configuration. Uh, I, I guess I'll take this one. So, in terms of the longest baselines, I mean, there is data in this image from 15 and a quarter kilometers. So, there's not a lot of space left with the current uh, infrastructure to move the antennas a lot farther out. Uh, in fact, we we have almost sort of, sh you know, once you get into these extended branches, it's sort of shaped like a, a, a Y with crooked legs and crooked arms. We went to the ends of two of the three arms and, uh, and fairly near the end of the third. And so there's not a lot of space there. In terms of going to higher frequencies, I mean, directly detecting the object itself that's clearing out these gaps, probably not, uh, simply because it's big and doesn't have a lot of surface area. What we could very likely see, uh, again, to be confirmed, I mean, we'd have to look at the right kind of object, and, and maybe this is the right kind of object, but we have to see, is we might see a remnant disk around a planet forming. So you might see something that looks like this, at much lower resolution, of course, but surrounding a planet that you don't see at the middle because we can't detect the, the young planet itself, but we can de detect the stuff that's orbiting around it as it uh, gets ready to accrete down to the planet. That's a possibility. So I have a, a process question that I was really intrigued by from the news release. It said that the antenna were moved to be spaced no further than 15 kilometers apart, and so I was wondering how that compares to their normal um, arrangement, and also um, why that made a difference to this, um, having them closer or further apart than they usually are. Well, the further apart the, um, the further apart you get the antennas, the higher resolution, the finer detail you could see in these hmm. astronomical objects. And so up until now, the, the furthest away. Um, the events have been for routine operations have been about a kilometer and a half. We did a couple of tests last year uh, at about three or three or so kilometers apart, but that was not with nearly as many antennas. It was just actually just a couple. But this was a very dedicated campaign to move the antennas very far out to get the, one of the highest resolution um, images available and to test the capabilities that we could actually offer hmm. for the uh, next cycle for all map observations. Are the antennas going to stay that far apart, or are you going to rearrange them in, in some other other? We, for the next we start moving them next week. We start moving them back in next week. So the campaign is winding down. We've done pretty much all the tests that we could do in this time frame that were given to us um, by uh, by Stuart and, and the other guys. So it's time to move back and start doing um, PI PI science again in a compact configuration. And you mean you usually were saying if if this gives the best resolution, I get asked a lot, why don't we always observe this way? And the reason is because you have to have um, the further apart the antennas are, the the brighter the object needs to be for us to be able to detect it at those those long baselines. So there's a lot of science that you need to have the antennas packed close together usually when you're trying to observe objects that are intrinsically large and um, have very low surface brightness. When you move the antennas further apart, you can see this amazing fine detail, but only if there's structure that corresponds to that very high angular resolution. And so the, the objects have to be bright and compact for us to observe them at this high angular resolution. So that's why ALMA has this capability to really dial in the resolution that's going to be best for the science that you're trying to do. Does that make yeah. today's discovery even more um, compelling in that this infant star was that bright that you could see it in this manner? Um, Stuart mentioned earlier, and, and now we can just bring it up again, that there, because the pre previous observations of this source kind of just showed a blob, there was a real possibility that we wouldn't see very much when we observed it with this really high angular resolution. We could have resolved out most of the emission. Um, so 
in that sense, yes, we, we felt very lucky that, in fact, this object showed lots of detail on these small size scales. That, that wasn't guaranteed to be the case. But it probably does say something intrinsic about planet, the planet formation process and the time scales that we do, in fact, see all this detail, even though the star is only a million years old. Can I throw out a question to uh, Stuart here? This is, uh, OK, we see this, and maybe it gives us a little more hope that uh, planet formation is, uh, is easy to come by. You also use ALMA to look for molecules in space, essentially organic molecules, uh, uh, the pre precursors of life. And if you put these things together, just in your own opinion, uh, do you kind of go to sleep at night thinking maybe the chance for life out there is a little bit better now? Well, I think this is actually a good question for the three of us combined in terms of our different areas of interest. I mean, uh, uh, but I mean, from my my standpoint, I, I think we should all chime on chime in on this one. But uh, yeah, I mean, for me, we've got a lot of planets out there. We knew there were quite a few. Uh, we now know that they're probably around earlier than we expected with this image. That may make a difference to how their atmospheres and how the chemistry proceeds within the disk, but again, right now we're getting outside the realm of my my interest and into the others, so uh, well, maybe I'll hand off to, to Tony or Crystal, who wants to go next on this one. One of the things that we know very early on is that, you know, the process of developing the large organic molecules and, the, you know, when life first formed on the planet itself and, you know, on the early Earth, um, there isn't a whole lot of time to form um, these large prebiotic molecules from the end of the head bombardment period to actually the first, you know, fossil relics that we've actually seen on, um, on, on, on Earth. So, you know, looking at systems like this and starting to use the sensitivity of all of them, and this is all speculative now because we don't have any, any observations that back any of this up, but, you know, perhaps this chemistry that's going on in these disks um, is bottled up into comets and meteorites and asteroids and then get impacted onto these early planets and they basically seed these planets with the prebiotic organic molecules that will actually start and kickstart this process of forming larger organic species. So, you know, we still need, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done on this, but this is just you know, another piece of evidence that we now can use, you know, you know, ALMA to actually look at these very, you know, compact sources very Earth-like systems and actually actually try to trace the chemistry that goes from the disks and possibly down into the uh, early planetary systems. Uh, like Stuart said earlier, I think that really the next step of trying to understand this disk is going to be to try to detect the gas content and see what the gas is doing in the disk and what all kinds of molecules we could detect and whether whether there are already organic molecules in the disk at this early phase is going to be a really interesting question. And there's there's going to be plenty to do in the future because those kinds of observations are, are even more challenging than what we've done here. And we only had about 30 antennas uh, to use in our campaign. And when we open this up to astronomers um, for science, there, there will be 50 antennas which will really even further improve the sensitivity and make, make more discoveries possible. So in fact, I think you've sort of hinted at the answer to this, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, we've, we've gotten in a few more questions on Twitter. So what exactly is dust in terms of its chemical composition in this, in this context? Well, the dust will be composed primarily of silicate and carbonaceous materials. Okay, so it'll be either a, a silicate grain, um, you know, have silicon and some other uh, atoms attached to it, uh, or primarily, you know, large carbon kind of containing um, organic material. So that's basically what this dust is made of. It's mostly silicate or, or carbonaceous material. Okay, okay and uh, another question that's come in, how many science targets have been observed by ALMA in this long baseline configuration? For... For the science verification part, we have, and the day that we're going to release to the community, we've targeted five objects that range that range the entire uh, spectrum of all the science uh, science goals and basically the scientific uh, 
category that people put in proposals for. In terms of the total number of objects observed, though, it's it's far far larger, but they tend to be very boring things, of course, because the first thing that we did was not to rush out and observe HL Towery at, at uh, 15 kilometer resolution and see what happened. Uh, the first thing we did was we said, ah, what is the most boring thing that's the smallest, most compact thing we can look at? And we looked at it, and then we said, is it bo does it appear to be small, boring, and compact? Ah, the answer is yes. Okay, so at least we're doing something right and then moving onward. So there's, there was a lot of those kind of observations in the early days where you would take that or, you know, observe two such objects and, and see how they look compared to each other. So, I mean, this... This is the end game of the, the campaign, uh, really, but there was a lot of uh, boring from the public standpoint uh, activity that went on well before this. Sure. So I've got a couple more technical questions here. Uh, the, the first one is, how could the MWA or Meerkat add to the resolution and knowledge here? I'm assuming you know what those things are. Um, so those, those telescopes, uh, operate at very long wavelengths and uh, very low frequencies and this particular object isn't going to emit a lot of uh, emission at those wavelengths so so Meerkat and MWA probably wouldn't uh, detect this object. Um, the very large array in New Mexico at the higher frequencies that it looks at um, there's I, I happen to know there's been some very interesting observations done recently there um, showing the, some of the uh, particularly emission from the photosphere of the star. So down into the centimeter wavelength regime you'll still have emission, but when you get to the meter wavelengths of the MWA, um, this particular source will not have very much emission to detect. Okay, and my other technical question is, what is the linear scale of the disk on the Facebook astronomers page? And I'm assuming that's the, the, the photo that's, that's gone out today, the image that, that you all have provided. The, I, I haven't looked at that page. The diameter, the approximate, very approximate diameter of the disk is about 235 astronomical units. Yeah. Just, just for all those who are interested out there, right before we started doing this, Crystal was putting together a fact sheet of uh, information about the, the, the image itself, and we will try to post that in a, in a few places so that people can have that, uh, that kind of information. But uh, with, that was uh, stopped in favor of doing this event. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just because the National Science Foundation is all about our, our foundational research and foundational science, I'm wondering, um, what, what do we get from this kind of information? What ultimately do we learn about our universe when we make discoveries like this? I mean, to me, and again, I think this is probably a good roundtable question because I think the answer sure. from each of it would be different. I mean, to me, it's it's sort of in a fundamental how we got here kind of question. I mean, that's that's how I feel like we're headed with this. You know, what, how do you get to the point where you have planets nicely orbiting and, evolve, you know, a mature star with water and, you know, molecular content which supports life? How do we get to that point? I mean, we, we know that it happens, clearly, because we're here. But, you know, how did, how did the rock we're standing on get here? How, how is it beneath it and how are we above it and how is the, uh, the atmosphere here and how, the, you know, how do we have water in the oceans to handle... Uh, life as we know it. So, I mean, for me, with this this object, that's what we're really getting at. I mean, some of the other objects we have as part of the campaign answer other sort of more fundamental philosophical questions as well that have been around since the beginning of time. But, I mean, for me, it's really a question of how we got here and, and, and aiding in understanding what our origin is back to, you know, grains of sand coagulating in a, around a young star up until you know, biotic molecules. But, you know, Tony, Crystal, your, your thoughts? So the research that... That, that, answer. That, that answer is pretty much the same as what I would have given. <laughs> so the research that I'm primarily interested in is actually trying to understand how this chemistry takes place um, 
you know, that's going on that's forming these prebiotic molecules in the universe. So, you know, it's we have only tapped the very, you know, very surface of understanding chemistry because it's usually, you know, done in a bottle in a lab somewhere on the earth. And if we want to really try to understand fundamental chemistry that's going on in the universe, we need to look at these extreme environments and try to get an understanding how do these molecules form and how do these big organic molecules form that eventually coagulated into a large, you know, chain of, you know, molecules that forms RNA and DNA. So we don't, we've only scratched the surface of our understanding of chemistry until we could actually look with telescopes like ALMA and actually try to understand the overall universal chemistry that's happening. So that's, I think, one of the most powerful powerful things here is that we now have the capabilities with ALMA to have this very cross-disciplinary um, research that looks at, you know, how does chemistry go on on a universal scale, not just here in STP in a lab sitting um, sitting on Earth. Sure. So it seems to me, and I'm going to I'm going to really extrapolate here. We've got this infant planet. We find uh, all these planets that seem to be circulating around and then growing and, and whatever. It seems like there's an increase in the number of planets we've we've thought even existed out there. So does that increase the potential for discovering other extraterrestrial life or habitable planets and things like that, or am I pushing it too far? I think, I mean, in terms of the impact on the final numbers of planets, I think we'll have to have our gas images that we're still working on to understand what the dynamics are here uh, for that. I mean, it, it certainly doesn't hurt uh, the probabilities by, by seeing that we have potentially large planetary cores that are stable far before we thought they were there before. It's certainly not going to decrease the probability in any way, shape, or form. And how much of an impact it has on the plus side, I think, remains to be seen. Do we have any, I was just thinking, if we, if we don't have any uh, pending questions, maybe we can just, uh, I don't know if this is heading toward wrapping it up, but maybe ask each of our panelists, OK, you've got 30 seconds kind of summarize what it is uh, you really feel about this, and is there anything we haven't discussed that you want to raise? This is your chance to uh, go ahead and voice uh, the effort that went into this, what you think of it, you know, just 30 seconds each. So maybe we can start, uh, Tony, with you. Anything that you'd like to bring up we haven't mentioned yet? Um, from my point of view, uh, you know, from the not so much technical standpoint and science standpoint, you just have to give, you know, thanks to everyone here at Alma that basically put the whole thing and the array together. Um, you know, the this is a worldwide effort to do this, um, and I think that has to be really emphasized. And not only was the the worldwide effort as a team, but put all the infrastructure and everything together to actually build the thing and put it wherever we put all the antenna stations together where and where all these antennas are actually sitting. But we have experts from around the world that have come down for the last two and a half months to and dedicate part of their lives. Thank you, Crystal, uh, to reducing data, taking data, observing. You know, spending very long, sleepless nights up at ten thousand feet. You know, just to get images like this out. So, you know, that's that was my thing. Is basically keep the team motivated, keep the team uh, active. You know, basically give them all the tools they need in order to make this great, um, th these great images that you're seeing now. So this is the fruit of a whole international team of people, and I'm just going to thank everyone that has participated and has given us support to do it. Thanks, uh, Chris. Lee, anything that you'd like to uh, add or just uh, throw out there that hasn't been discussed yet? Um, not much. I would like to second what Tony said. Uh, the just the 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 number of years and the many many people worldwide who have made this particular image possible. Um, he hasn't said much yet, but I think Al Wooten is is there with you, Charles, and he's yeah. certainly one of the people who. Uh, championed the ALMA project from the very beginning and, and sort of got it off the ground and moving and helped form the international collaboration that's made this possible. And uh, it's been a, it's really been a privilege to get to work on this. Well, I'm going to actually ask Al to step up here and just do that. If he can maybe give me 30 seconds of, you know, he's been listening in right next to me but hasn't chimed in, but you know, stand up here, Al, and just tell us what, uh, you know, you, anything we haven't said that you want to say to make sure the world knows it. Well, 
Come on. You're on. Yeah. Okay. Well, the the uh, Alma effort, of course, started 30 years ago, and there's been a whole lot of work uh, going on uh, and leading up about 20 years ago to the discovery of this site and the measurement of its uh, characteristics, and then leading to the uh, walking off the uh, positions where the antenna pads might eventually go, uh, getting those through millions of kinds of approval, approvals, environmental and otherwise. So as uh, has been said before, there are really a lot of people that uh, have participated in this over the years, uh, many of whom have gone on to other things. So uh, we really appreciate all their efforts getting us to this point after uh, 30 years of effort. Great. Uh, Stuart, anything you want to mention at this point? No, I think uh, the only thing that I'd like to, to say on top of this, I mean, I, I, you know, I can't agree more with everyone else that the, that the everything that's gone in to, to building not just the infrastructure, but all the technology, the high technology, and, and, and plus the staff that, that are up there relocating the antennas for us. I mean, they, you know, Tony talks about how the campaign starting to wind down on Tuesday. Yeah, the, uh, we can move about two antennas a day, and we have 23 antennas way out there. But the two antenna moves is a very stressful and, uh, and difficult process. It takes pretty much the whole of the daylight time up there. So those guys are going to be up there really pushing it for a period of uh, a little bit more than two weeks to get us back into a, uh, a very compact configuration. And, and that's a real challenge. And, and the guys have done a great job in getting us to the point that uh, that we're at. So I think that's that's a thanks I'd like to add. But then only on on top of that, I, I think all of us here, Al, Crystal, Tony, and I, worked previously at, at kind of precursor instruments to, to Alma. And I think we all had different dreams of what we wanted to do with our facilities before. And for me, it was to see fine structure and circumstellar disks. That's what I really wanted to do in my... And we were not able to do it with uh, the previous instruments simply because the sensitivity and the resolution wasn't there. So for me, seeing this uh, Saturday, the first version of this image of a few Saturdays ago now, it was really the the realization that something that I had been wanting to do since you know I was uh, 20, 23, 24 years old is 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 real. It's here now. It's actually happening. It's uh, it's a huge step forward in what we've been able to to see before and just knowing that 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 this isn't this isn't the end of it either it's just the first the first one of these images that we have and I'm sure that the menagerie of things that we're going to see in the coming years with the high resolution with Alma with all of the antennas working together at higher frequencies even than this is is going to be even more spectacular I mean this is just sort of a realization of the first steps let's say and and, and that was really great for me personally I felt uh, uh, humbled by by being able to be present at that at that moment in in science uh, of, of planet formation at least. Great. Well, I want to thank everyone for participating. I have to say, um, coming from working at the National Science Foundation, it's it's moments like this that really get all of us here very very excited to to see uh, an instrument that were one of a handful of inter international owners of and to see it being able to um, make these discoveries that are truly going to advance a whole field is, is really exciting. But uh, thanks to all of you folks and the international partners on this, um, this, this is really an exciting day for all of us, I think. So um, um, unless we have anything else to add, um, I just want to remind everybody that this Yep, I just really do want to point out that uh, later today, hopefully soon, we will have a FAQ of some additional information. We'll add that to the news release that's on the NRAO site. So if you have any, any more technical questions, we'll try and answer those and uh, post them for reference later. Absolutely. And the other thing I was going to remind pe people of is uh, if you had friends who wanted to tune in and couldn't, uh, this Google Hangout is going to be on YouTube and uh, within Google Plus uh, shortly after after the Hangout is over. So uh, you can let them know they, they haven't missed out. They just and they uh, they can probably even get questions answered as as Charles just mentioned. So, but otherwise, signing off from the National Science Foundation. Thanks everybody for your participation and your great science. We really appreciate it here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.